John Guaneri is my guest today. He's a former Secret Service agent who now does security for bands like Motley Crue and Shinedown. And he also has a few podcasts of his own and has had some really great conversations with some of the most interesting people on the planet. Lots of great insights and stories here. A fascinating conversation coming right up. A lot of the guys I work with are pretty simple and low-key where they don't want to make extravaganza red carpet type stuff. But some clients, they want the private elevator, they want doors held and stuff like that, just how they want it. So you have to advance that with like the hotel staff, the front desk, uh, everyone. Yeah. So do you do you think in your mind of like doomsday kind of things, are you, are you are always thinking like, okay, what's like the worst thing that could happen? Well, you know, you're always looking for like the vulnerable spots and things in a room. Yeah, it's yeah. it's one of those things where like obviously a lot of these hotels and stuff, they've had these type of events before. You're not the first or the last type of client or person to come through there. So a lot of those systems and plans they have in place are actually really well. Okay. Um and so <clears throat> sometimes the only issues I would come across if especially after the pandemic, a lot of the, the, the people that were there for so long that I've known over the years, they either were forced to retire because uh, they won't get vaccinated or they just want to retire to just retire or some of them have passed away. So trying to teach some of these new hotel people that got promoted and stuff to kind of how to deal with all this advanced type stuff mm. is a, bit of a process, but there's always crazy people. So that's always the one outlier. You control what you can control. You worry about what you can worry about. Other than that, you just have to adapt if something does happen. Yeah. So a lot of it with security and whether it's secret service or rock band, it's all about just mitigating the risk, right? I mean, Correct. you never can be a hundred percent and make sure there's no risk, but if you make it a lot safer and easier, then you have less chance of an incident, right? Yeah. hundred percent. There is no, yeah. I mean, an ideal world, you'd never want, everything should be a hundred percent, right? The ideal perfect world, mm -hmm. no matter what we do, no issues, no traffic, I'm not, I'm not gonna forget my wallet. My car's not. My car's gonna start every time, but it's the planning that goes into the what if scenarios. So before I even go on a tour, I've done this so much now that I try and plan all the what if scenarios in my head. Say that our car breaks down, or we have a stalker that made a threat on social media, or we have a unattended bag uh, or active bomb threat, which has happened numerous times with clients and venues and stuff. So it's like plan your head how you think it should go. And do everything in your power to make sure it gets that way. And I've been fortunate to work alongside great law enforcement or local staff and security and stuff where they have great plans in place. And there sometimes those places where they suffer, they lack leadership. And maybe that has to be a leader, but the people that are afraid to fail or maybe they think the they think the wrong thing, that's what people are gonna hurt or death or injured. It's these people that are very quick witted and go with your gut and feel it out and just go with it. Just don't, if you think about failure, you're going to fail. So I always think of, you know what, this is a really terrible situation, but this is what we're going to do guys or girls and we're going to do it. So. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting when you talk about like uh, stalkers or uh, threats and things online. Cause like I, I friends with a DJ here. Just, he's just a, you know, he's a local FM radio DJ. And uh, one time we were hanging out and like one of his buddies, I said, Oh, where's your buddy? He said, Oh, he's not coming. Uh, he got some death threats. This is a guy who was like on like an MTV show or something. He goes, and, but the DJ is like, yeah, and I've gotten them too. He's like, anybody in the public spotlight gets death threats. Like people, I don't think people realize how common that kind of stuff is. Yeah. It's one of those things too, where you have to treat everything like it's a real threat. I mean, obviously if you and I were to get something from some Ponzi scheme type thing from Kenya, like if you don't give me money, uh, I'm going to kill you, blow you up. And I was like, dude, <laughs> the chance of it happening is it's not going to happen. But in this world, I mean, we just dealt with one up in Ontario uh, where a guy for the last couple of times he's been up in that area, Toronto and Eastern Canada, where he's made threats to not only myself, but the guitar player and bass player. And he's off his meds. We know who he is. We have all the pictures. He'd be fine one day. And the next day he'll send us crazy stuff. Like, I'm going to kill you if you don't support me and all this stuff. And you have to go through this whole rig of the whole show the picture to his local staff. Make sure he don't let, keep, he can come in, but keep tabs on because I always think my always thing is as long as it's not an, like an actual is he a threat? No, I think he's off his meds. I think that's what everyone's kind of determined. But I, I never want to make him even more upset with us. Where if 
we say he we we catch him at a show and we don't let him in and make a big deal out of it. Now he has the ammunition, so to say, to now when we're in a hotel or outside the venue where we have extra security to possibly have a gun pulled on us or a knife. So it's just yeah, it's we live in sad times, man. I think people are just either aggravated for the right or wrong reasons, and they think that violence is the right way. And it's just especially with social media, anyone can type anything. It's just like you don't know how I'm going to read it or you're going to read your own thing. So you're just like, what are we doing as people? Yeah. And it, well, it's interesting. Cause like you look at the thing, like, like the, uh, like the airport, I mean, the security is, is so tight there. I mean, I just really, I'm trying to think like, I haven't heard of any incidents at the airport. It's been a long time. I mean, other than people going crazy on the plane and, and yelling at each other and, and punching and stuff, but nothing with a gun or a knife or, you know, I don't think anybody's like been, uh, fatally wounded. No, there hasn't really, there hasn't been any terrorist a- attacks or like threats or bombs. I mean, be, remember after the 9 11, we had people sneaking stuff in their underwear, their socks. I mean, obviously, all the hijacked stuff. But I mean, the funny thing is, I literally last year I walked through the Reno airport with my knife in my pocket, forgot about it, and walked right through the magnetometer. <laughs> what? They, they, they didn't say a single thing. And I'm just like, oh God. Mm. So, I mean, I don't know. It's, like, it's one of those things too where. You always see these videos of you like these venues we are at, these amphitheaters and arenas and stadiums where people are trying to sneak and stuff in, or this is a special gift for guys of a veteran. So I have this knife and a special bullet. It's like that stuff like that. You kind of you have to be able to work in the gray area there. I mean, I think honestly, you can look at people coming to the airport and see who the threat or not the threat is. So yeah, it's interesting though with concerts too. Even yeah, I feel like for the most part, I mean, if they go through security and the metal detectors. It's really, I mean, you get the, I guess you get a plastic bottle with a, with beer. I mean, it's hard to like hurt somebody after you've been through security and you take away any sort of weapon. That yeah. Have. But I mean, you're allowed to walk in with your car keys or pencils or knitting needles. So you give me a sharpened pencil, I can stab you. So it's like, it's like, where do you draw the line outside the normal guns, knives, pepper spray, brass knuckles, stuff like that, where that people can start getting creative. And then you're also trusting someone who's doing something for eight dollars an hour to do their job and defend their job and defend oh, the yeah. lives of other people. So it's like you got that human aspect there. It's like, I was, fortunately, I've dealt with some great venues and staff throughout the years, so I've never really yeah. had an issue. With Have you ever seen that meme of the, or it's like a, a GIF, or it's like a short video? It's where the security guard and he's going like this, like just really just. He just barely yeah. touches the guy, and there's all these like titles that they give it, you know. Like, I think that was he... Liverpool, England. That oh, okay, very, yeah, that was, yeah. I mean, luckily, nothing happened that show, but I mean, it's one of those things where it's like you watch that, it's like, oh, if I want to go here, or say you're a extremist and you don't like uh, the gay lesbian population, you want to do a post nightclub, I'm going to target that club when they have their next gay night or their next Christian music night. And it's just like you people see that stuff, it's like. People are always watching. Bad guys and girls are always watching. So it's like when that stuff gets out there, it's funny to laugh at. I laugh at it, but I'm like, man, this could this could have been a really bad day for people. If this was someone had a shitty day at work and they wanted to snap and start shooting or stabbing, it's like people got to take their job seriously. Yeah. Well, how do you, so how do you, because I know your background, you went to uh, this uh, Norwich college, which I had never heard of, but I guess it's the oldest military college. It's it is uh, well-known and established. Is that is going to that school? Is that how you kind of got catapulted into Secret Service? Because I mean, you went from like you basically having not a lot of experience in security to being working one of the number one security jobs. Yeah, so I I've always wanted to do military. I've always wanted to serve, whether it's law enforcement, military, or something like along those lines. And mm-hmm. uh, I would I chose Norwich because I wanted to be in the Navy. I wanted to be like either a submarine or like system warfare. And uh, my sophomore year, long story short, my dad got sick, brain aneurysm in a coma for a couple of months. And my biggest fear was if I signed the paperwork to commission my sophomore year, I would get sent somewhere and I couldn't help my sisters at the time or my mom um, if something were to come up. And I felt like if my dad wasn't going to come out of this, I feel obligated to stay stick around the area and kind of figure out something I still want to do and love but be close to them and not be sent away for six to eight months at a time nowhere near them if I have to get home. And so that's when my friend at the time was two years older than me. He was just about to graduate and started the process his junior year at the Secret Service. He's always driven motorcycles and he got the job where he could lead the motorcades all around the world uh, on the the bikes. So he was like, John, you're going to love this. Put all your eggs in the basket. Screw DEA. Forget ATF. Just 
don't even think about FBI. You're going to love this because I've always wanted to serve and protect other people. And so, yeah, I did that from 2008 to 2014 and uh, under the Obama campaign or the whole Obama uh, presidency. And uh, 2014, I met my partner and CEO now, the private security firm, uh, backstage at a Charlie Sheen show. Uh, when he just got fired from his TV show. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember he did those yeah, shows. He did the uh, Torpedo of Truth tour. And uh, you I got was to meet the, Charlie Sheen, or yes, yeah, so I did. So I knew friends at the time when he was in DC, and so I went there and I saw my partner Chris in the corner and just went up to him. I obviously knew what he was, his job was, and him and I just hit it off. And he says, "When you get bored of the politics of uh, the government, you should think about maybe joining the politics of the entertainment industry," which. It's a little bit better, I think, than the government because I'm my own boss, so I could tolerate the politics a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but I went through divorce at the time, around 2013 or so, and uh, I was just kind of burnt out um, from a situation I was in. I still love what I did, but like doing it for the people I did it for and going through my whole personal stuff, I was like, I need a change. And that's kind of why I joined private. So I've been here ever since. Yeah. It's still fascinating, though, so that you because you just went right from college to Secret Service, like you'd think that they would want somebody that had had experience that had done, you know, the FBI and, well, you know, law enforcement and military had all these like experience and background. Or why did they pick? And then you and your buddy um, both went right from college. Yeah, I, it's one of those things, too. It's like the process. I mean, my polygraph was two and a half days. Yeah. Tell That's me all, about that. So. That's crazy. They asked that, you about if you had sexual thoughts of animals or something. Animals like and like weird stuff. If you like, so all they'll ask you like twelve questions, but they're all worded differently every time. Like, when's the last time you lied to your parents, or stuff like that, where you're kind of like caught off guard. You're like, well, hold on a second. Like, you talking about when I was four and I took a cookie from the cookie jar. And so they want you. To, they want you basically maintain the same answers through everything. And so they'll ask. They'll throw out random questions like, how often do you think about having? Uh, sexual relations with animals or have you thought about doing this or like just you questions just like laugh that at some of these questions yeah I, I think i think that's that's part of the human aspect of it and every time i'd laugh or make his face it'd be like you just gotta answer it and they obviously mm. they knew what the deal was but you have to pass a fitness there's a huge fitness component okay. uh there's a psych evaluation there's entry-level exams you have to take like post exams and stuff like that and even the process to make it a secret service, you have to graduate four months down in Glencoe, Georgia, which is under the Department of Homeland Security. So you spend, you do the basic training under the umbrella there with shooting, driving, uh, basic protection, counterfeit stuff, drug stuff, uh, a lot of fitness, hand to hand, all that type of stuff. And if you graduate that, then you can go and set up the Beltsville, Maryland, which is a secret service training uh, facility, which is another three to four months of specific to that job. Which then you start doing the rope lines, how to survive helicopter crashes, uh, flying well armed, um, training like that, which is on very specific, obviously, to secret Wait, service. How do you survive a helicopter crash? So if when you're at the when you if people that are, obviously when you see at the White House, Marine One, there's three of them that always land on the South Lawn. So obviously you don't know which one he's getting on once you leave the South grounds. So if there's ever a threat you're not sure which one you're targeting to bring down the president, whoever's in the Marine one. So there'll be three helicopters that fly over the Potomac or whatever. And the likelihood of being hit by something would probably be over the Potomac with him. And so if you land in the water, how do you survive a crash underwater? How do you get your seatbelt? How do you grab the protectee? How are you grab and move stuff underwater when you can't see under distress? Wow. And then, so I'm assuming this may, might be a dumb question, but do you guys wear bulletproof vests all the time? Um, on, on paper, yes. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those things where it's like we, we do different details, say you're in uh, like Israel or Jakarta or places where it's like Palestine type stuff where you're kind of like it's wars, and ish, there's stuff always happening. Um, and it's one of those things too where it's, it's a shame because sometimes I would not wear my vest around DC or uh, in certain situations because it was all about comfort, right? Which hmm. That might rank with some people. Uh, but when it came down to it, it's like the team, the, how that's so set up is like if if I'm about to be hit by a, a bullet, like there's the layers of security that gone has gotten that close. There's bigger issues to worry about. Huh. Uh, but yeah, you, you carry, you should carry it. I think everyone should. If you issued the gear, you should always carry it because obviously it's issued for a reason. Uh, but when it comes to private, Stuff I never wear a vest for any of that. 
You, you, you said you definitely do or I don't when it comes no. to private stuff. No, if I'm in a suit or whatever, like I'm not, I'm not worried. About, about but you that. said something about how you do dress like a secure, you dress the part you you wear like a suit. You don't just wear like jeans and a yeah, t-shirt. no, it's, it's for me, it's a deterrent too. when, especially walking to venues, whether it's dealing yeah. with local staff or other patrons out there in the front of house area, you see someone come in with a, in the dark with a suit on, you're kind of like, well, this is even worst case. This person has to talk to me because they don't look the normal. You stand out, right? And for me, I always like that where it just helps kind of calm the situation because it's like, when you, for me, if I saw someone with a suit coming my way, I'd be like, okay, what happened? Like this, I can't lie to this person. I got to be legit. Or especially if I have to hop the barricade now, which has happened with medical situations or fights or whatever, they see that coming. They just scatter. So it's uh, it helps me do my job because I think it's a deterrent. Because uh, you feel like, for me, I feel proud. Like I feel like, I'm uh, I'm representing something that I believe in. It's like if you feel good, you look good, you're gonna act good. And so for me, that's just kind of a mental thing too. Oh, that makes sense. So do you when you work for the Secret Service or like Shine Down or whatever, do you have to sign like an NDA where you can't talk about a lot of stuff? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's all uh protected stuff. The the government stuff. I think just like you have to wait. I think I could wait another seven eight years before if I wanted to like write like a book or like talk about it. Mm. Uh, like, but I I would never. The people that do that are just like I don't. There's not, I mean, there's sure that I've been privy to a lot of stuff that I think people would think would be maybe crazy. Uh, but I don't, my goal is to never share that. Like, I have no need to share that stuff. Wait, say I that again. That. You're privy to stuff that what? I mean, I've been privy to some crazy stuff working yeah. in the government um, that I think people would be like, what? Uh, but I would never share it because I'm not like that stuff, something I experienced. And I, I kind of I protect that value of what you did uh, and why you did it. I'm not here to like, throw names under a boss and stuff you're saying uh, like personal stuff not not government secrets and things yeah, well i mean yeah i mean there's been i've been places and seen stuff that uh, maybe 0.5 percent of the population seen so so wow, stuff like that, that sounds fascinating you can't talk those, about it. no i there's some of the stuff i just can't talk about well some or, of it's public though right because that whole thing like Obviously, if you worked till 2014, you weren't involved with the nine people who lost their jobs with the prostitution scandal. Yeah, and... the, the, two of those people were my classmates who were involved in that. Yeah, but you were Cart- Cartagena. No, I wasn't down there. And, and then they got the thing they where got... there was like a, a three of them were sent back after a night of drinking in Amsterdam. I yeah, didn't the Secret Service partied. I didn't. I didn't yeah, know that no. was a thing. The, the big, they all party. And I think the 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 problem there is that the Secret Service took all the brunt of that. There was there was uh, there was military aides, there was presidential staff that was all involved with that. And they I think the Secret Service took it on the chin there. So uh, uh but yeah, I mean it's that's one of the things too. It's like when you do that high stressful job, I know a lot of my friends are in law enforcement or were law enforcement, to maintain the stable life at home or not drinking when you can drink till you pass out or stuff like that, where it's it just it's a very high stressful job. And sometimes the people that can't deal with it are the ones that kind of fade out or just get away or they can't they, they these demons appear and they just can't chase them off of them so mm. what's the can you say like what was the most scared you ever been or was there a time where you were um, really scared yeah there's when we went over there with obama there's uh like israel palestine like rail on the border there uh some hairy stuff um for obvious reasons with the whole yeah. palestine israeli and the gaza strip and everything um but yeah, I mean, there's been times private security. I've had guns pulled on me, or people have they threatened or threatened me and stuff. And if I'm with someone, uh, but it's never, it's never like where Hollywood portrays it. It's like this nonstop flood of just fist fights. And because if you're in a bar or a situation where a fight breaks out, my job was to get out of there safely with the client, not sit on the ground and start doing jujitsu and martial arts with a biker gang. Like it just. It's always so portrayed. How do you, when you, a gun gets pulled on you, do you try to talk him out of it, or you immediately grab? Yeah, I mean, there, there'd be a way you you have to you'd have to really read that situation like really in real time and just make what you think is the right call. Hmm. Uh, in both times, uh, there was no hands on. The guy just kind of was kind of. I don't know. It's easy to say people are off medication when they do that stuff, but yeah. he wasn't a sane person, obviously. Okay. Um, but like, well, like a lot of the training I did was how to disarm people with guns and knives and just how to just do all that stuff. It was uh, that, that that's what I missed the most with the, because the, when you're the, the government stuff, 
you get month your quarterly qualifications with shooting, driving, like medical stuff, active shooter training. That's the kind of stuff I miss because it's like it's so built into what our schedule and career. Uh, where private, you kind of have to do your own thing, which is why my we kind of started doing our own training too, uh, for people who want to be bodyguards about how to like maintain not only fitness and the mental aspect of it, but like the training aspect of stuff changes or laws change. And that's the big thing out here. It's you can't, I can't really just walk into some countries or cities or states with my firearms, even though I'm licensed because New York might have different rules than Massachusetts or DC or California or Wyoming or Texas. It's like, there's a lot of times you see people, Oh, I'm a bodyguard. Just get, they get arrested in the airport or whatever. Cause they don't have the right paperwork. Or they're not even supposed to be carrying a firearm. It's like, that's a big part of this whole industry. It's like you have to know the the laws, the rules, the regulations. It's uh, it's a lot. Yeah. So when you talk about things change, um, I mean, just because there was the whole rash of police shootings, it seems like that's kind of died down a little bit. But is there different strategies that maybe, as a security expert, is there is there ways to de-escalate those situations without jumping to the firearm with for police? Uh, maybe using the taser or other other things. Yeah, I mean, I think. For law enforcement, there's you have to escalation of a uh, uh, use of force policy. Yeah, uh, that's what it's called when I was in there. Where if a guy has a so if a guy is coming at you with fists and kicking, you know, he's a big guy, whether you're a guy or girl, I was trained. Well, I'm gonna go to my baton now because I can strike right. him. The attacking, the attacking limbs, large muscle groups, I can attack him with my ta- baton and bring him or her down. Now, if that person has a knife or it looks like a shiny object in your hand, you know, if it's a key uses a brass knuckle or brass knuckles. Now I'm going to transition maybe because I wasn't trained on the taser. So I can't really speak Um, on that. We never carry tasers, hmm. but maybe I could use my pepper spray or OC spray. I have if I wanted to use that, but if it's in a large group of people, my partners are there, my my teammates, why am I going to spray pepper spray? That could affect everyone. So then you're kind of like, well, I'm going to use stand my baton. But if this guy has a knife or a large weapon, a baseball bat, I'm pulling my gun out. It's, you always have to be one step ahead of the perpetrator. Yeah. And I think sometimes it maybe it's inadequate twa- or inadequate training uh, or people that aren't comfortable with what they, what tools they have on their duty belts that I think sometimes people are, it's, it's easy to pull a gun because it's, you can't get any higher than that. And what, but once you pull the gun, you may be ready to pull the trigger because you're not going to throw your gun on the ground and, transition back to something else so right is that is that a thing too where they train the police if you pull the gun you shoot to kill because if you shoot yeah you're not shooting they they can pull a gun on you right if you shoot to injure you're gonna miss someone hit a bystander there's gonna be a ricochet it's just stupid so if you're gonna pull that gun be ready to use it i think sometimes people a lot of times you think it's situations hairy where i've been doing where it looks like it's come to blows you start talking to these people and you rationalize with them right there you've already mitigated a lot of paperwork a lot of health issues for the, both the you once you get in this fight and you're kind of like hey use your voice because at the end of the day we're all humans i think people are uh, people do understand you and if you don't speak the language that i'm dealing with someone in another country how you present yourself and hold yourself and position your body tells them they might understand what you're saying but they know you're here to help and don't want this to escalate and i think that's a lot of the training a lot of these departments uh, are getting one because their bosses or whoever the elected officials are want to defund police where for me, you got to fund police to the point where they're all getting adequate training. Don't skip well, yeah. on training gear. They should all be shooting yeah. as much as they can go into scenarios, live exercises. Like that's, that's, what's going to change the, the uh, perception of what law enforcement is because I, I very, there's bad apples everywhere. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately in that, in that industry, uh, you can't afford to have a lot of bad apples, but they're there. And it's like, again, hold each other accountable and just believe you what you do. I think will help alleviate that. Cause there's been times where we've been out somewhere back in the day where some guys acted tough or dumb and say, dude, hold yourself accountable. Like you represent me, my, my, my organization, my agency. And like, it's why are you going to be that guy? And I think that's what gives people a bad name about law enforcement. Yeah, I didn't understand that because, like, I know this is probably maybe I'm beating a dead horse, but with the George Floyd thing, like, the guys like put got him in a chokehold, and it's like, okay, like you got him. Like, why are they not arresting him? Like, and the other cops are all standing around, and they're seeming to, like this is the procedure. Like, was were they just following the procedure on that? Yeah, I, they- I, I don't know because I again, I'm not I'm obviously I'm familiar with that 
And I, yeah. it's easy for me to look at that and be like, I wouldn't have done that. Um, but some of their stuff is like, they were saying he was resisting arrest or, uh, it was again when you when you and I watch this stuff on the news, and it's not even in real time; it's a video that's come like minutes later. Yeah, I'm like, man, why would they do that? Or that's that's that that's not the right way to do that. Or I know what the choke was, but you're kind of like, why do you keep going on with it? Right, or, and then all the other cops seem to be like, right. It's like that's it, that's what I didn't understand. It's one thing like, if you got like you said a bad apple, but like. The other cops seem to be like, yeah, this is what we're supposed to do. Like they, yeah, it was like he weird. was doing it's the like, right thing. It was confusing. No one approached him and say, hey, what are you doing? Get off him. Yeah. Or like, or they didn't try to help him. Like, okay, let's arrest this guy and put him in the car. Yeah. It's strange. So yeah. maybe that is part of the thing is that getting better trained. I, I think there also needs to be better training for citizens on how to deal with law enforcement and security like yourself and police and secret service, all this stuff. The the idea of community policing is awesome, especially I know some small towns that do it where uh, every year, every couple of years, the, the law enforcement team will go into the schools, like the middle school, high school, all the private schools in the area, just be like, hey, this is who we are, this is what we do. If you see, see do this, say this, just call this number if you need help. If you're suicidal, mental health, drug addiction, you do see something, human traffic, all this type of stuff where it's like it puts it out there like, hey, these are these people. But some of the, the most successful ones, my cousin, uh, he's a cop, and when he does this, he's like, they'll go in there and do like, hey, come down to the community center this weekend every couple months, and we're going to go over how to call in a uh, medical emergency. Like sometimes when people are in a mall and someone falls down, they don't know what to say at 911, the 911 call. They don't know how to say approximate age, male or female, location, where you're calling from, what you saw, all these vital information that people sometimes just call 911 to hang up. It's like, well, you're making the situation worse now. Yeah. And it's like training like that, how to deal with protests, how to deal with it. You come across a car accident or you're in the middle of a car accident or you're in something. It's like how to deal with this. So the guys that go and play with like the kids and stuff in uniform, it's like, I think the media tries to make all law enforcement seems like, super aggressive i've seen more of cops play baseball with kids or wiffle ball with kids and communities and hanging out with everyone it's like the media is not going to put that out there because they want obviously stuff sells right when you talk about well, all the shitty yeah all it depends on cops. which channel you're watching because yeah you, know, you got the other side that's saying like oh every cop is a hero and it's like well right no, like you said there's bad apples too right right they're definitely not defunding the police as in and all cops are terrible like i don't believe that uh, statement either i think we're all human right there's some 100 mistakes and 100 uh, most of the cops i've worked with uh, i worked in the schools and i worked with a lot of police officers i mean they've they're all pretty good guys i would say with some of the cops that i worked with and maybe it's just because that's they give that job to the cops who work in the schools but a lot of those guys were kind of lazy <laughs> yeah it's it goes back to what you said before it's like you can only afford to be lazy until there's a school shooting or an active shooter or a, a traffic yeah. stop that goes haywire and unless you're the you... cop in florida that just ran away or whatever <laughs> yeah some of those it's just again it's it's sad. Some people just they just take it as a job and don't treat it with respect. And I, I think the community policing and the the active to keep training and love what you do. Just don't yeah. This is the type of job where you or be a doctor or EMS or firefighter. Like if you do that just for a paycheck, uh, maybe you should change career path because you're not you're not your head's not right for that. There's other jobs right. you can do that probably make more money sitting at a desk as opposed to maybe showing up to a police or a fire to call on time or it's just, I don't know. Yeah, I'm well, very... it's interesting because uh, you worked for Obama, but I've heard that you're more conservative, but you also said you'd take a bullet for him, which I think is pretty honorable Like to say, like, hey, this is the job I'm taking, and even though we disagree, you know, I'm here to, to do well, my job. It's, that's also, that when you take that job, it doesn't matter what policies you believe in or left or right, elephant, donkey, whatever you believe in. Uh, it's just a job. It's like I have... I obviously I, I I probably very more conservative, much more conservative, uh, even probably even some maybe libertarian, maybe in the middle. Um, but I also have a ton of friends and family that are the exact opposite of me, but we all get along. And it's like you don't I think we let politics decide to like determine who we ought to act like or be like. And it's like just be yourself. And uh for me, I I this industry the private, uh I'm I'm able to kind of pick and choose. Uh, who I work for because I obviously at my level um, I would never work with a client not political but if their views were like uh, if they're like 
where any time if you're with a client that makes you question your moral compass, mm. that's when I would be like, yeah, I don't, I don't need to work with you. Find someone else who can, or here's another guy or girl that can do the job, maybe better than me. Uh, but I, I don't I align with you. Like you're going to put me in a tough spot. Like I like guys and girls that are human beings, but that aren't going to make me get in fights with uh, cartels or just dumb stuff like that. So, mm. uh, yeah. I mean, but you're saying so like if there's like a, like a guy who's maybe more of like a thug or something that's yeah i mean trouble it's, a lot it, it thug is like cause sometimes again the media will make you think like oh that guy's a thug and i'll be like oh i love that guy he's great he's <laughs> a great dad and so it's just like really? it's so for me it's like it's someone that if you a lot of times the people that the artists that fail in this industry of celebrities they surround themselves with their family or friends that just take 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 from them and they're gonna milk them drive take their cash take all their stuff and you can just, you watch tmz every night and see a different celebrity that's like got way too many hanger odds. I like the artists that have like the right hand on their shoulders, uh, that know what they want, they surround themselves with the best of the best, and they kind of go through and do their their stuff. So yeah, well, I mean, that's it's... interesting. Explain that to me. The hangers on. So you've seen that up close where you've seen bands or uh, oh yeah, like the bands people... that, bands that you, you'll see ba- artists that they have a big hit, and all of a sudden they're the talk of the town, right? Well, they've been doing those small clubs with their 35 friends from high school that they've been paying squat who have just been milking off their teeth this whole time. Now when they hit the big leagues, these same people want more milk. And it's like this person feels obligated to take care of that because they've been with us since day one. When in reality, the right people are going to stick by you at your highest and your lowest. And it's it's unfortunate where you see some of these artists in the last couple of years have died, whether suicide or overdose, uh, who who just lost everything went obscure because they didn't have the they didn't listen to the right people who were telling them, hey, you don't need to keep paying these people to hang around you. If they're gonna be around you, they're gonna get the training and do all the stuff that you need to get done to make sure this this runs smoothly. Otherwise, if you're here for a free ride, you're just gonna bring the whole ship down. Yeah. So they don't because I mean I saw Entourage and like that guy had like what like four friends. He had like a manager oh, and, yeah. and a driver. But you're saying there's people with like 30 friends? There, I know people, I know artists that have guys that will roll their weed for them. <laughs> yeah, is, doesn't Snoop Dogg have somebody that does yeah, that? Yeah, but I mean he, he's a little bit different because he's that guy's probably a, afford that. He's a very uh business entrepreneur. He's actually he's an awesome guy. Have um, you worked with him? I did passing different events and stuff and award okay. shows. Um, great guy. Um, but the people that that have the guy that hangs out with them or the guy that uh, he's the buddy of the bus driver. So he's just going to hang out on tour the whole time. Well, he's he, take cutting into money, space, time. It's just like all that stuff adds up. Like you don't need a guy that just sets up your uh, barbecue tents. Like you don't need a guy that or girl that curls your hair on Tuesdays or some of these people are just like, you're just wasting money and surrounding yourself with idiots. It's dude. At the end of the day, people care about you, the artist. You don't need to keep wasting your time and energy on the stuff. It's literally going to bring you down. So it's like, you think they're hiring them because they're, they're friends and they want to. Yeah. It's like, it's a comfort. And maybe they are good people. Some of them are, but why are you, when you get to this level, you need to have the right people in place to be successful and go even higher. And so that's so interesting to hear that. This is really, yeah, because like, yeah, so, I haven't talked to a lot of people at that, you know, that huge level of like playing arenas like Motley Crue and Shine Down and Justin. Yeah. Did you work with Justin Bieber a little bit too? Yeah, my something? company did that uh, last world tour, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's uh, man, it's crazy. There's uh, you hate seeing it because a lot of these people are good people, but if they don't want to listen to you, you what are you gonna you're gonna do? So. Well, yeah, and it's not. It, if you're doing security, it's probably not even your place to say anything most of the time, right? No, I mean, I, a lot of my clients, I've been with them for since I start, like since 2014. So I'm not one of those guys that jumps around. I stick with the same bands. Um, so I've seen kind of like these these people that have these kind of leeches I refer to. What They just fall off and they just go away and everyone moves along. And you can see the growth. You can see the, oh, we're at this level now. Like some of these bands that are starting up, Every time they roll to a city, like, oh, I got 45 people on my guest list. If they're really your friends, don't you think they should have bought the tickets? But now you invite the whole parking lot on your guest list. No one's buying tickets to go to your show. And that's why you'll always be at that level, which is a little club band, because you don't, you just want to take care of everyone. If people want to support you, they'll buy your tickets. Yeah. I mean, I feel like there is that uh, line where 
you know, you being loyal and being supportive for your friends, but also like people taking advantage of you. I yeah. see that that way too, that it's like, I'm always trying to be nice and help people. And I feel like so I'm the same way. Take advantage of that. I'm the same way. It's like, I will, I will buy the band's merch. If I like a shirt, Yeah, I could easily get it whenever I wanted, but I buy it because I believe in the band or the client and I love the, sh- if I want, I'm going to get it myself. So these people want to show up or, I need these tickets. I need this amount of merch. I need this pack, backstage parking. I need catering on a show day. It's like, you're not entitled to any of this stuff. Oh, these people guys, do that for like oh, fans? Oh, God. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. So like, yeah, because they would just have a list, huh? Yep. There's some, those people, have, fortunately for me, have kind of gone away. Like all the people that come backstage and act that way, they're great people. And it's usually family. Uh, but you always get the one occasional person that's very like, I need this, 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 this. And a lot of these times people go through me because they know the band will just say, hey, talk to John. Well, now I'm just like, after the pandemic, I'm like, hold on a second, guys. Let's try, maybe we should clean some of these people out. Maybe we don't need these people back here because they are negative or they're they're just, they're a waste. Have you ever had, what about like with meet and greets with fans? Are you, do you uh, coordinate some of that too? Have you ever had to like remove fans for being too? Uh, yeah, there's been, for to be too drunk, um, usually. Uh, every time that happens, it's it's usually because I've been drinking all day. Uh, when it's the bands that do their own meet and greets where people pay, there's really not a lot of issues. Where I've had the most issues is when the radio does like their giveaways for meet and greets, um, and there's no control over there. The radio doesn't know what they're doing in terms of controlling their people. They're hammered, they're drugged out, or they're just ignorant. Um, and so sometimes I've had to kind of deal with politely remove some people. Uh, but again, it's Generally, all the fans are great. They don't, uh, they don't cause a lot of issues per se. You'll have the people obviously that get in fights or stuff during the show that they're going to fight at the grocery store. It doesn't matter where they are; they're just going to be that person. Uh, but nine times out of ten, all the fans are great. There's no issues, and the, when every time there is an issue, it's always an outlier of that one guy that has a gripe to pick or had a bad day at work and doesn't know how to deal with it. So now he comes to a show and starts punching his wife, uh, which happened. Uh, oh really year. dang yeah so i've seen actually seen an uptick in a lot more domestic type uh fights like that at shows i don't know if it's from the pandemic people angst like bent out of shape for those two or three years i know i was for a little bit and so that aggression but as we get further away i still see it i'm just like what are you people doing like it's your wife or girlfriend or your sister or brother like you're your friend or you're and just like how do you treat another human like that that you know I can only imagine what these people do in a situation where they don't, they actually hate this person or whatever. I'm just like, it's just the human aspect. A lot of this industry has been kind of corroded away over the years. And so that's always my biggest worry there. Yeah. I think sometimes it's like people there, they have, like you said, that maybe the pandemic or whatever, but they're stressed. And then they feel most comfortable to express that anger on someone they know. Cause it's, right. it's more comfortable than a stranger, which is kind of sad, but uh Yeah. Yeah, a lot of cat fights uh, last year. Girl on girl, just slapping, fighting each other, friends. And again, chalk it up for alcohol, yeah. jealousy. But I mean, that's it's, interesting. It's yeah, because when I worked in the schools, um, you know, and I was a counselor, and we we had way more girl fights than boy fights. And it's funny because the boy fights, you'd break it up, and like they'd be friends the next day. They'd be like, "Yeah, it's cool, bro." And like the girls, they would hang on to that uh, fight for for years. You know, like I if I have a if I have a fight in a freshman. And as when they're seniors, they're still mad at that girl. It's like they just yep. can't let go. It's interesting. Yeah, it's weird. When you worked at the schools, did you have a lot of the training and stuff like the active shooter stuff? We started to, uh, yeah, we started to have those uh, trainings, and then uh, we had the the drills, like the yep. lockdown drills. We started to have towards the end of my uh, school career. It was very very bizarre and uh, just interesting learning. But yeah, they said that like the people that come in it's all a numbers thing and they're trying to get the biggest numbers. And uh, I actually had a, a psychologist on my sh- show, which unfortunately no, not that many people listen to it, but it was a really eye opening uh, interview with uh, Dr. Peter Langman. He's like an expert. He's written a bunch of books on mass shootings and school shootings. And um, I mean, he says most of these things, there's warning signs and we just don't, we, we haven't trained everyone to look for them. And if I think, feel like we trained every citizen, not just like every school official or teacher, but I'm mean, every citizen. Yeah parent and uh you know student and everybody to look for these signs i think we could prevent probably 99 percent of it yeah it's like sometimes people that are like the bus driver type people the custodians they hear it see yeah. so much you're right that 
they're some of the first people to actually, hey, this is going on, or I heard mm-hmm. about this, or they'll approach a kid and be like, hey, are you okay at home? I saw a bruise on your arm, or are you being bullied by my boss? And stuff like that, where it's like people that step up above what they're probably paid to do and just be a good human. And yeah. you know, again, it's funny how it all goes back to training and how to read those signs. And, and every time people, a woman or, or a, this, this friend of mine, her, she's very like, she she's obviously people get upset with school shootings, which if everyone should be upset by it, why are they happening? Right. But then it's like, well, I'm like, well, we should do arm guard. We should do training drills. Like, why do we have to do training drills? It's, it's, it, it, these are our kids. These are our, we never did these when we were kids. I'm like, well, this is the world we're dealt with now. Mm-hmm. I never went through those training drills back in the day. It wasn't until Columbine happened where I'm just like, oh my God, this actually could actually really happen. This isn't a video game now. And so it's like, if we have these, these situations where active shooters are happening, yes, it sucks that our kid who's nine years old has to deal with this type of stuff. But and I'm not saying maybe treat like sex education, whereas you get older, you learn more, but have them be aware where exits are or how to break that window, or open that certain window or how to lock that door. It's like, this is all stuff where an active shooter situation, it's fortunate to happen in schools. They're going to happen at church too, or the mall or the movie theater or where your parents work and you're visiting for uh, bring your kid to school at work day. And so it's like, we live in a world now where you have to think about the stuff. It's unfortunate. You have, you can't spend time talking about nature and run around on your bikes with your kids, playing baseball till dusk. Now you have to worry about, Hey, this could happen. Or this guy could pull up in a car and come to the playground or so. I, and we just have to adapt. And I think uh, the sooner we can adapt there and use our resources and training and stuff, uh, I think we help mitigate that stuff, but I don't envy anyone in the industry of education today. It's just, it seems like you just, it's just nonstop brow beating. Yeah, me either. That's why I left. But um, yeah, it was interesting when you say we're gonna have to adapt. So do you think that maybe with schools and like malls and things like that, because, you know, airports, concerts, pretty safe. You got the metal detectors. Yep. We don't have metal detectors in schools. We don't have them in the malls. I mean, those are two big areas. Is it going to be kind of like all major public places are going to start having I mean, like an airport? It's, ultimately, it comes down to money too, right? I've, and I don't mean to get political here, but I would have rather spent half the money we sent to Ukraine to maybe approve the church security or school security, uh, our own border security type stuff. And so I'm just like, the if it's all great if you want to do what you what Live Nation does at their venues, which is great with the security, the back searches, and the, the yeah. patrolling and stuff. But can um, every mall afford that? Who's going to pay for that? At the end of the day, taxpayers, the most vocal ones are the least ones most likely not going to pay or want to pay that bill or even put that on the docket. So it's like we just have to be better humans. All these times, people are like, "Oh, but like teachers should not be their kids; they're your parents. They should be a, a extension of what you learned at home or how you treated at home and how to, the real world should operate." But and we just put so much effort. It's like it starts at the home, honestly. I think so. Yeah, it unfortunately, started- like a lot of the kids I worked with as a counselor, it was like, uh, and I hate to say this because I know this isn't politically correct, but it was a lot of single parent. Home yeah, it, it's the, tough. The, those kids really struggled. Now, so, not all of them. Some of them did great and fine, but I think that really put off stress or a lot of the kids that really, or if it was two parents, both of the parents were very either very busy with maybe they were into drugs or something, or they just worked a lot and they were poor and the, the parents were working and just trying to, you know, pay the bills. The kid is just raising himself or raising being raised by Xbox, and so those yeah. kids struggle. And and yeah, you're right. I mean, the teachers are asked to kind of parent these kids because. They're not getting it from their parents at home. I remember going as a, when they go like grade school up to middle school, high school. Be like, oh, here's your guys' counselor for the year. Uh, go talk to him. It's like I always treat it like, oh, this is what, these are the classes I'm taking. Sign the paper. My parents will sign it. I checked in with you. But now it's like they there was there. I mean, I'm not gonna say I still don't know if I understand depression. I've never been depressed per se. So my friends that aren't they can talk to me about it. I kind of get where they're coming from. But for me as a kid going through grade school, I'm like, why would I tell some stranger that I'm having a bad day mentally or I'm tired or I'm not having suicidal thoughts, but I'm just like, oh, like this sucks. Like, why am I taking this class? Like, this type of stuff. I just, ne- I never got, I was never told that Gauss counselor was so much more than that. Like go ch- talk to him about, uh, there was a sense of like, um, 
because I went back for my 15 year high school, I think, and uh, talking to them like, hey, you, we, 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 we had we, some of your classmates were dealing with some crazy stuff, and like you just never, you were never that guy or kid at the time to be like, oh, I got this stuff, or I feel bad for my sister, she's sick, or something like that. Where it's like these people, I wish I was told that, hey, your gals counselors, your person, your guy or girl, you go to confide in, bitch about your teacher. Uh, say, or even his other issues at home, like, hey, my dad just lost a job, or my friend's not feeling, he's got suicidal, I'm worried about him, how do I do this without still being his friend and not coming off as overreaching? I wish today kids, like, take advantage of those resources. Yeah, well, it's, and it's like, like you said earlier, even sometimes it's not the counselor, sometimes it's the bus driver. Right. But as long as they have some adult, actually, what's ironic is a lot of the kids really gravitated towards security guards or uh, the the security uh, resource police officers in the schools, one of the two. Like, I remember in the, my first job in middle school, the most popular guy on campus was the security guard. I mean, probably too, because he gave candy to the kids, but the kids loved him. They thought he yeah. was so cool, you know? And so I think that, you know, having some sort of adult, because like I said, a lot of them, the parent is just not that role model for them, unfortunately. Yeah. Imagine being a parent and you have to be a role model for 22 kids. It's like that, that would. Yeah. It's just crazy. Teachers aren't paid enough to deal with all that and to put that on top of what you actually do. And you're just kind of like, oh my God, that's a lot. And if you yeah. have kids on your own, then you got to deal with your own child issues. And you're just like, this, it's a lot. Definitely. Yeah. It's, it's tough out there. I, I agree with you, though. Just if we could all be better humans, I think that would be. Uh, but I think, too, it's like awareness and training on all these things, like how to deal with police, how to recognize signs of, of, you know, somebody that could potentially be a mass shooter. Like what was the one where the girl, the guy texted some girl randomly and said like, I'm going to do it and sent a picture of like a bunch of guns. And she was just confused. She's like, ah, I don't know what, what is going yeah. on. And then it's like, if we could train people on, on every citizen to know that kind of thing, to report that immediately, we could prevent a lot of this stuff. I think. Yeah. Well, you feel you'd be like, Oh, this kid had a journal and his parents be like, I never knew he wrote all this stuff. I never saw all these signs. Well, you're never home. You never took interest in your kid. As soon as he got home, he locked the door and he played Grand Theft Auto, which I'm not right. knocking video games, uh, <laughs> but I play that game. But like you just do all that stuff where you're just yeah. kind of like, what do you, I, I, I honestly think like, I don't know it's my training. I know obviously someone like you could be like, if you're with a group of four or five people for a whole year, you're going to know whether they're having a good or a bad day, whether feeling, whether it's weather issue at home, they're sick, whatever it is. And if I, I'm not a parent yet. Um, and so I don't know what it's like to actually have a kid per se, but I do watch a lot of kids and people that act like children. And so I am very perceptive to what's going on. It's like, we just have to be more observant. Like even yeah. if the coworker, if you're, if you're that coworker is always laughing and having a great time and making other people laugh, but you notice a change in him. I mean, maybe he, maybe he's the next Rob Williams where you have all this happy, happy, happy. And you're the saddest person. Like when no one saw him, it was like, Oh man, like I had no idea, or he was so hurting, or he was sick, or it's just I don't know. Like we, it, maybe it's easy to not say those things. Maybe it's I, I, you and I go to bed like you know what? I'll talk to him tomorrow. But what if that person doesn't make it to tomorrow because you're not talking um, to the right people? And so, I, I, I think if we just be good humans and empathetic towards people and just watch, like get off your phone when you're going across the street. Like just the world is happening so fast. Just stay present where you are and just be alert to everything. Yeah. I mean, we're so connected with social media and all that, but it also makes us more disconnected because people aren't out into the real world as much. And like, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, like everybody, we we knew all our neighbors. Like, I feel like now oh. I, I don't know any of my neighbors. It's like, yep. I never see them. Like, it's weird. I come home from touring. I mean, I've only been home this year for work, maybe, maybe 12 days so far, hmm. uh, but I'll come home and they know what I do. They, they hang out or talk, shoot the shit in the backyard, cut grass or it's like people are aware. I, I, that's why I love living in a small town because everyone knows. It's almost like Cheers. Everyone knows your name and stuff like that. But I'm fortunate to have that. But I maybe if I didn't have that, it would be tougher what I do. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, 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 the whole thing's very interesting. I like the fact that people know you, know your family. It's a very – it's like, hey, there's some weird car parked off front. Or, hey, do you hear this – you see this bear. So we, in the you're saying yeah. is the song is true. There's a, the try that in the small town. Is, there's yes. a little bit of truth to that, that yeah. people are more connected in a small town. They are. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. That's interesting. I was going to ask you too. I don't know. I don't know if you can comment on this, but um, 
what was your thoughts on did you know the chef that died that was Obama's chef? What did you work with him? Was that uh, after I knew, you left? Yeah, I mean it was kind of after he I left. Uh but I knew of him. The whole thing's very weird, just the way the media put out they knew how old the guy was and certain traits, but not who it was or his name. And then it wasn't until I just the, the way that just the press release came out of that is super weird. How do you not how do you know the age of someone but not know who they are? Or like it just, I was just like what? And, but the circumstances, the guy's a does triathlons, pro athlete, sw- lives his life on the whole ocean, and he drowns in four feet of water on a paddleboard. Like it just I'm just like, what? I mean, stuff straight people could drown in a bathtub, I guess. Uh so it happens, but I'm just like, it just seems super weird. But, I mean, not the situation, maybe per se, just how the media it went from body found on Obama property to thirty uh-huh. seven year old still trying to identify. Well, how could you know how old he is but identify the name or next of kid? Like, it's just weird. Huh. And I, I went, but we went back and read all these news articles yesterday. I was like, all these press releases were super weird. Huh. That's interesting. Well, Coming from, I mean, you would have a more uh, yeah, it's just, opinion. Yeah, I mean, again, it's, I have a whole thing for the media. It just the whole the whole. <laughs> yeah, thing it is, is just, interesting. And it's hard to sort through. There's so much, you know, media now. There's on like, both sides, it's stupid. Yeah, it's like everything's and, dumb. And then you people, and it's funny things people with like hundreds of thousands of followers will tweet something and it will just be like a statement and people will believe it. And I'll always like go and Google and go, is this a real article? Is this a real story? And a lot of, some of the times it's, it's not. And I'm like, and people are believing it and they don't get debunked. It's really weird. The use of like, I went from enjoying memes to, I'm not sure if this is a news article or an actual meme. And then you throw (laughs) in this new AI stuff. You don't know what's real anymore. It's just so fascinating. Yeah. No, it's wild times. Wild it's interesting time. too because I just I love to learn though and I love to investigate things and I love going down the rabbit hole. But yeah, you just got to make sure what you're reading is true. Is there is there any truth to this? Is this like you know conspiracy? Is it you know? But some of the conspiracies that I thought were conspiracies have become true. So then you're right. like, well, maybe this is just predicting what's gonna be the real truth. Yeah. Story. In the meantime, all this UFO stuff's coming out where we're we're just so blindsided by everything else going out the world that they're just throwing out this UFO stuff like it's nothing. Yeah, and you can you can't you can't comment on uh, any UFO stuff you saw when you. No, I mean I, I'm not gonna. I mean I I have, I'm friends with people like Stephen Doctor Stephen Greer. Yeah, you stuff. had him on your show, right? Yeah, he's a good dude. And so if watch his latest uh, documentary on that, like the consciousness and his whole thing right now is like there this technology's been around forever. And we've had it, we've been using it. And that's why a lot of the whistleblowers coming forward now. Um, I don't know if you follow the Sean Ryan podcast, former CIA, former Navy SEAL, I believe. But he's been having a lot of these government whistleblowers on his podcast lately, whether it's UFOs or uh, different war stuff or just some stuff we know in our last 30 years when it happened. People blow the lid on some of the stuff. It's so fascinating. Yeah, no, I would be definitely very fascinated to listen to any of that stuff or the JFK stuff. I think it's JFK, Bigfoot. I mean, the whole thing, it just and every year it seems like more people want to debunk like 9-11 stuff or. Any event that's happened in the last 30 years, I feel like someone's going to question it. And yeah. maybe maybe we should question everything. I, I'm okay with that. But let's just be sensitive to the fact that people have lost their lives to stuff. And how do we kind of, I mean, how do you how do you know what's real or not? That, I mean, what's fact or fiction is like, it's so blurred now. It's like, you and I can look at a set of numbers. You could look, you could take those numbers and go a completely different direction. I'm going to go with those numbers. Maybe you look at the numbers. I look at the numbers that aren't there. And like, that's how we figure out like, so I'm just like, how do we as normal people in the middle just try to figure out life, just kind of sort through all this bullshit. Yeah. Well, I think it, part of it is maybe like, you know, like I just do it for fun, but I try not to get too wrapped up and stress. Cause you could really stress yourself out thinking oh, about shit too. And like realizing well, <laughs> like with the AI and everything, I mean, that stuff scares the shit out of me. Yeah. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. It's, it's like the wild west in social media right now. Absolutely. Well, yeah, and and you, so you do, do you do three podcasts now, or or two? Uh, yeah, so I I do three. Uh, the main one I do is Spear Talk, which Spear is talk. security related. Yeah, I have actors, authors, conservationists, uh, lawyers, psychologists, basically uh, any type of genre I want to cover, kind of in the security world, or coming from my a lot of the questions come from my world, asking them about the stuff they do. Um, but that's that's been doing amazing um 
Yeah, you've had yeah, some good guests. You just had the uh, guy that the real Donnie Brasco. That one. Yeah, Joe Pistone, and uh, I've got a bunch of great. I got Aaron Brockovich coming on, Boss Rutten, oh, nice. uh, a bunch of other actors. It's, so it's like for me, it's it's therapeutic because it kind of breaks up what I normally do, and it gives me time to. Ever since I started that the pandemic, I've read more books. I think as a kid, I've always loved reading, but as you got you get you get too busy for reading, right? And so for me, this gives me a reason to read the book now. Read the autobiography, read the research of certain topics, whether it's uh, uh, wildlife conservation, cartels of the ivory, the ivory tusks, or uh, the history of the Second Amendment rights and why we have the stuff like that, where it's like now I can just do like these deep dives into certain subject matter I normally probably wouldn't read about. Now I do just to research episodes. It's a blast. I yeah. I've actually enjoy love reading again. Is um with the ivory tusk is that one of the biggest conservation issues that uh you you see um I think the problem I would say for in terms of conservation it's I mean it's a part of it uh my friends are like Sea Shepherd uh or the Earth League International Andrea Crosta uh he's been involved in a couple of movies one on Netflix called The Ivory Game which is obviously about the poaching system and the cartels with the ivory tusk in Africa he's also part of Sea of Shadows which him and uh, uh, sea Shepherd, uh, they're basically a twofold thing protecting the vaquito, vaquita, and the Sea of Cortez, this super rare fish that's being harvested, uh, I think for its gallbladder, something oddly specific where the Chinese cartels and mafia will pay millions of dollars and millions and millions a year just for a specific body part. And so it, it basically details this wow. harvesting of all these creatures. But Earth Think is involved with all these different animals, whether it's the cheetah, the leopard. Uh, uh, certain owls, lizards, uh, just this crazy stuff where it's like all these angel or angels, these animals are being ha- trafficked. Yeah, um, well, I think and is sharks one of them too because I think sharks, yeah, shark fins, amazing too. Creatures. shark fin. I mean, you look at oh. uh, the Wuhan Dog Festival in China that kills all these dogs every year, which is just disgusting. Or uh, black. Why do fin. they kill the dogs? Just to eat them, or what? Yeah, it's, it's the Wuhan dog, the Yuhan, I think dog festival is a yearly festival in China uh, that kills thousands of dogs. Uh, we're talking like German shepherds to sh- retrievers. It's you can if you go on YouTube and Google it, it'll tell about the history of this and that culturally why they do it. It's the, the animals in cages being cooked alive. It's just the most savage, barbaric stuff. It's like. There's like why I, my friends are always on the front lines trying to adopt these dogs and stop it. But with the way different cultures are, you're kind of like, oh, God, it's like the, the bullfights in Spain or the run of the bulls where culturally there. It's like you and I take a dog for a walk. But you, we look at it going, why are you stabbing the bull or why yeah. are you killing these cows just to kill them? And so it's it's tough to kind of stomach that stuff. But I mean, the whole conservation and wildlife, it's. It's super fascinating to me because it's happening every day. And there are Texas last year or so, someone was sneaking in chimpanzees uh, with the Mexican cartels into like Texas, and, like all these weird animals and stuff. And then you go down that rabbit hole. Then it goes to the invasive species and stuff that's happening in Florida, the Everglades, with people letting their snakes out or all this stuff where the ecosystem is being destroyed because all these non-native animals are eating and killing mm. or getting putting bacteria on everything and. It's, yeah, you uh, had that um, the alligator. I think that's yeah. how I found you, uh, Frank Robb. Uh, yeah, Frank Robb's awesome. We yeah, were talking it, about how he'd find these alligators, and he said a lot of them were in drug houses, that people yes. get an alligator to, like, I don't know, to be cool. Watch the cover. cocaine. Or, yeah. It's the, crazy. The, yeah. And then the, some of those animals that weren't, like, native to, like, Florida, they developed, like, this bacteria, whether something like COVID or another bacteria that – it would get the native species and wipe them out or kill them. And so that to- Frank Rob is awesome because like how vital alligators are to the ecosystem of Florida and the world. Yeah. It's like, we're all so closely connected. And like, if that equilibrium ever balances the wrong way, it's like, we're all affected by it, humans and animals. Yeah. That's an interesting, that, that's for sure. That's an interesting thing. There's, and th- that is a good thing that there's a lot of these documentaries and oh, podcasts awesome. that where we can uh, shine a light on it. I do. I, I would sound such documentary rabbit hole with the pandemic. I just, I everything from how these toys are made to animal trafficking to j- just anything about the history of the mafia to it. Just I like growing up as a kid, like we I always had to read those books. Like I never watched PBS or that stuff as a kid. I wouldn't. I wouldn't even allowed to watch TV really. 
But now, as an adult, when I watch the hotel room, I'll probably watch two documentaries tonight about subject matter I don't even know nothing about, whether it's performance enhancing drugs or uh, whatever another subject where I'm just like, this is so fascinating to learn this stuff in two hours as opposed to me going to like a library and taking out books and reading them. Right. Just, Have you seen the new one on Netflix about the uh, the new pyramid they found in Egypt? Yeah, it's in my queue. It's like two away. Really? You should probably. You, I tried to get the director on, and he's like, "Yeah, let me talk to the Netflix guys," and he blew me off. But you could probably get him. You should have him on. He that was yeah. Uh, I thought well, it was really I fascinating. Him, you, you could do the episode with me if I get him. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You had because you had a what you have another guy you had. I think that's how I found you initially was uh, Harry Turner. I, was that his name? Yeah, that, Harry Turner is a good friend. To have him on. He. Too, uh, yeah. Have you reached out to it? You got to have him. I'll, I'll yeah, tell I tried. Him. Yeah. Somebody told I'll, me about his documentary. So I reached out. I, I, I looked up his name and I saw he did your show. And then I was like, oh, cool. And then I saw that's how I, then I found Frank Rob and Frank said, yes, but uh, Harry hasn't uh, responded. I'll put you yeah, direct. He's, Harry's story is amazing. And that's actually yeah. the charity. Uh, I'm really looking forward to like helping out with Emerald Arch. Oh, okay. So yeah. I'll it, put that in the show notes. Yeah. So his organization, they didn't know Harry Turner. It's on Amazon prime. It's called wildcat. And it basically details his journey dealing with PTSD from being a British soldier, the horrors he saw in war, to living in Ecuador and helping raise two orphaned uh, oslets. Yeah. Uh, and it's like the most harrowing, like triumphant, like it just it's just you'll you'll laugh, you'll cry. It's a super powerful documentary. I can't re- recommend it enough. And so he, I just saw him recently. And he lives out in the Washington area. Washington and, State or Washington? Yeah, DC? Washington State. Oh, that's fine. And uh, he's gonna he start his new organization, the Emerald Arch, um, is basically gonna start. He wants to buy all this land down back in South America where animals and habitat can be protected from poachers. It actually involves like veterans and stuff to help with their PTSD and stuff uh, to kind of help with the animals and kind of just find a purpose. Because uh, when you watch the whole movie. Uh, you realize like uh, seeing someone struggle to find their purpose, uh, they, they having him find it. He just got married. Like Harry's super rad. Like he's a, yeah. he's awesome. That's cool. I, yeah, I have to check. I haven't seen the movie yet, but I just had a friend tell me about it. I definitely want to. And I love that whole story. I read a story about that. Yeah. Just finding a purpose. I think that goes back to the whole depression thing. I think that's why yep. people get depressed is because they lose their purpose and then they're like, they do stupid stuff. Yeah. yeah. Chasing that drug and chase that dragon. That's, yeah. Only, that's only gonna end one way death and uh seeing uh and why the documentary with wildcat so good it's like you'll see there's footage of there where he's cutting himself because he just can't deal with the stress of like the combat he's suffered like the loss of an animal with his broken home or like going through a terrible rela- personal relationship in life and seeing him be triumphant hanging out with him in person it's like the most it's like the coolest one of the coolest people i've met in a long time where i'm just like i got super like goosebumps around him wow and uh yeah it's just a very his story is so unique and powerful that even if you're not a soldier a former military or people that deal with uh suicidal thoughts uh or not knowing what their purpose is like you could really pull something from this just, i was blown away like he's an incredible human being that's amazing. I definitely have to check that out. I I do agree too, like with veterans and PTSD, having an animal could, I know my brother was in the military and he got a dog and I feel like it, it really helped him a lot. I mean, yeah. So yeah, I think that's cool. Well, yeah. thanks so much for doing this. I'll put the uh, website. You have a website that's just your own website. Or... Yeah. I usually just put my YouTube channel for spirit okay. talk, my podcast. Yeah. I'll put that. I... In, I'll put that in the show notes along with the charity and uh, yeah, we'll be in touch. Thanks so much. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, sir. All right. Bye, John. My thanks again to John Guineri. Follow him on social media. Check out his Spear Talk podcast. He's had some great guests. And if you'd like to support our show here, you can follow us on social media and make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel because I'll be posting some exclusive content on there. It won't be on the podcast format, but we'll supplement the show very nicely, I think. So I appreciate your support for my guests and the show. Have a great day. Shoot for the moon.